Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on low carbon urban form. We are joining you from Tokyo Development Learning Center in this side event of the 30th Asia Pacific City Summit organized by Fukuoka City. This will also be the fourth event of the World Bank Knowledge Sharing Series on low carbon and climate smart cities. Today's event benefits from the collaboration between Fukuoka City and the World Bank Global Practices of Urban Disaster Risk Management, Resilience and Land, and Environment, Natural Resources, and the Blue Economy. My name is Victor Mulas, and I am the team lead of the Tokyo Development Learning Center, the organizer of this series. TDLC is a partnership between the World Bank and the Government of Japan that serves as a global hub of Japanese and global urban development knowledge and technical expertise for practical operationalization. We have today an exciting lineup of speakers and topics. We will showcase good and emerging practices, policy measures, and frameworks together with private sector initiatives on the topic of climate smart urban form. Before we begin, please let me make a few housekeeping announcements. This webinar offers both English and Japanese simultaneous interpretation. The first session will be in English and the second one in Japanese. Please select the language of your choice by clicking the interpretation tool, which is the globe icon on the tool menu of Zoom. Throughout the webinar, so you have any questions or comments, please place them in the chat space, as we will have a QIA at the end of each presentation. Please feel free to post your questions in either Japanese or English. Um, the chat master of TDLC will bring your questions to the speakers and moderator. And finally, please note that this event will be recorded and the recordings will be available on TDLC website after the event. Now let's get started with today's program. Today we are honored to have Min Jan to provide the opening remarks for this event. He's the practice manager of the World Bank's Urban Resilience and Land Global Practice in the EAP East Asia Pacific region, and he joined us from Jakarta. Please allow me to invite Min to the stage. Min, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Victor. Uh, thank you uh, to all the participants. Uh, for joining the knowledge sharing series on low carbon and the climate smart cities. This is the fourth event of the series, as Victor mentioned. And today we will be discussing how low carbon initiatives and the climate smart urban form can foster resilient and more sustainable cities. The purpose of this knowledge sharing series is to share practical experiences and emerging trends from Japan and other countries on the development of low carbon and climate smart cities and hold an open conversation between the practitioners from urban environment sectors and our wide audience of civic leaders, private sector partners and other stakeholders. This event leveraged the unique expertise through the collaboration between Fukuoka City of Japan and the World Bank's two core groups or we call the global practice, the Urban Disaster Risk Management Resilience and the Land uh, Global Practice and the Environment, Natural Resources and the Blue Economy Global Practice. This event today is a side event of the 13th Asia Pacific City Summit organized by Fukuoka City. Core theme of the summit is toward achieving carbon neutral society. And we are very happy to be a part of this summit with this knowledge event on climate smart urban form. I would like to express our gratitude to the government of Japan through the efforts of the World Bank Tokyo Development Learning Center program that have made this event possible. I would also like to extend our great, great appreciation to all the speakers today. We have a rich lineup of speakers, including Dr. Leslie Marble from School of Engineering and Innovation in UK, and Mr. Yasushi Fukuizumi, VP 
of power systems from Mitsubishi heavy industries. We are also fortunate to have Mr. Junior Nakamura, Director, Greenery City Planning Section, Fukuoka City Government, to provide commentary and the reflections. Cities are major contributors to climate change. While we cover, while they cover only two percent of the Earth's surface, they are responsible for seventy percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. They are not just the contributors, but also receivers of the adverse impact of climate change, including urban heat islands, flooding, and the related health emergencies. The World Bank Group's Climate Action Plan for 2021 to 2025 will support transformative public and private investments in five key systems, energy, agriculture, food, water, and the land, cities, transport, and manufacturing. This will result in support for policies, regulations, and investment to improve urban air quality, decarbonize urban energy systems, promote green and resource efficient buildings and infrastructure, promote integrated solid waste management and circular economy approaches, improve urban transportation, and improve the coverage, efficiency, and the resilience of urban water supplies, sanitation, and wastewater treatment. Improving urban land use planning and the regulations is particularly important. What we need in addition are the adaptation mechanisms to adjust the built and the social environment to minimize the negative outcomes of now unavoidable climate change. Fewer than half of European cities have climate adaptation plans in place worldwide only 18% of cities with populations of more than 1 million have such climate adapt adaptation plans. To address the challenge of climate change in cities, one of the starting points could be to examine local level policy responses, which is important because it is the specific qualities of urban setting and the climate zones that determine relative vulnerability to particular climate impact. Based on this assessment, urban areas can make meaningful changes in land use and zoning, transportation, green space, and energy policy. I think if we want to live in resilient cities, urban form, including morphology, planning, and design of the urban areas must be our priority. On that note, I hope that today's participants can take advantage of this learning opportunity to reflect on the challenges of your own cities and apply some of the solutions to your projects. The World Bank looks forward to supporting city level initiatives. Thank you. And over to you, Victor. Thank you very much, Ming. Thank you for providing us with uh, these uh, opening remarks that frame uh, our event today. And with this, we are starting uh, this event and going to the first session. Uh, this first session will be about the Japanese case of Fukuoka City, and we'll focus on urban green spaces to adapt to climate change. This case will shed light on the relevance of and the practices that foster resilient cities through planning and developing green spaces. The moderator of this session is Leslie Cordero, who is a senior disaster risk management specialist at the World Bank, and she's joining us from Singapore. I would like now to invite Leslie to the stage. Leslie, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victor, and so glad to see familiar faces uh, with the TDD program. And I'm very excited to see how uh, and hear about the stories of Fukuoka City and how it can help our participants uh, learn lessons and innovate some of the policy applications as well as practical uh, programs and projects that has been done in Fukuoka City. 
It's very exciting because for this session, we want to highlight Fukuoka City in Japan talking about the city's climate change adaptation policies, particularly the role of urban and green space planning in facilitating adaptation actions within Fukuoka. You will hear and see the efforts of the city and how they have partnered and leveraged on local private companies in promoting smaller scale greening actions and lessons learned also for other cities worldwide. I'm sure everyone is very excited this morning. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you our speaker. He is a lecturer in environmental systems at the Open University in the United Kingdom. He is a social scientist whose research focuses on how coastal cities and societies can adapt to building resilience to changes in the environment. He is interested in understanding the role of knowledge and experience when planning local level adaptation to climate change. He has conducted research into local climate change adaptation across the East and Southeast Asia, in particular insights from Japan, Taiwan, and Vietnam. He is also a member of the Young Academy of Scotland and a future Earth Coast uh, Fellow. Friends, let's all welcome Dr. Leslie Mabon. Dr. Mabon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Leslie Mabon and I am a lecturer in at the Open University. Can I just check you can all hear me correctly and that you can see my screen correctly? Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so I'm in Open in Scotland, in the UK, and this, um, this morning, this afternoon, I'm going to speak a little bit about some work that um, I've been undertaking along with colleagues for the last few years on um, adaptation to climate change in Fukuoka City and the role that uh, particularly green spaces play in this. And despite being based in Scotland in the north of the United Kingdom, I've um, been to Fukuoka several times. My wife is from Fukuoka. Those of you who are familiar with baseball will recognize the, uh, the SoftBank Hawks hat. So what I want to speak about today is a little bit about some of the experiences that we've had in the field and what we've learned about how Fukuoka is using green space to, to adapt to, to climate change. So why do I, I want to talk about Fukuoka City? And to, to begin, I'd like to give a little bit of context about Fukuoka as a, as a city. So Fukuoka is um, Japan's fifth largest city with a, with a population of about 1.5 million people in the, the, the city government area, with about 2.5 million people in the wider metropolitan area, and around 5 million people in the, the larger Fukuoka prefecture region. With a population density of just over 4,500 people per square kilometre. But what is perhaps most significant and notable of all is that the population grew by 7.1% in Fukuoka between 2010 and 2017. And that's bigger, that's a faster rate of growth than Tokyo and the biggest rate of growth for any major city in Japan. So, I mean, I suppose that what, what I want you to take away from that is Fukuoka offers significant potential for learning for cities across the Asia Pacific and beyond in that it is a, a relatively dense, um, growing, expanding coastal city. Particularly the humid subtropical climate is perhaps relevant to, to a number of other subtropical cities in the, in the Asian region that are facing multiple climate change challenges. As I said, it's a city that is dense and, and still growing, which may be able to, to yield insights for a lot of other low latitude urban contexts. And I think what, what, what uh, for me is, is quite significant and important about Fukuoka is that although the city has, has done some things well in adapting to climate change, 
There are other areas where perhaps we can say that the city is, is, is maybe struggling, is maybe still developing ways of doing things. And I, I think at least sometimes we focus too much on exemplars and, and best practices in, in, in city to city learning and, and research and, and indeed in, in policy. So looking at, at locations where there are successes, but also challenges, I think is, is, is really important. And that's what I'm going to speak about today. And I look forward to hearing from, from colleagues at uh, Fukuoka City. So what, what are some of the, the issues that Fukuoka faces when it comes to adapting to, to climate change? Well, first, first of all, um, the temperature rise in the in the, the city has been much higher than the rest of the, the wider area, the, nearly twice as much as the, the surrounding area. Already the temperature has risen by 2.4 degrees in the last 100 years. And this has resulted in more and more extreme heat events and the result of urban heat island effects. As you can see from the, the little image that I've, I've borrowed on the left there from, from some researchers in elsewhere in Japan, the, the, you have a pretty significant urban heat island effect. Um, there's also more and more flooding from uh, extreme rainfall and from, from river flooding and pretty high high levels of, of rain, which leads to, you know, to, to, to flooding. The image at the bottom left there, you know, shows the kind of effect that that's having. Interestingly enough, as a, a fun fact, that photograph, that image was on my wedding day. I was in Fukuoka on that day and I remember just how wet it, uh, it was. So that there's also an increased frequency of extreme weather events, such as a heavy rainfall, typhoons, which um, very recently you know, have caused fatalities and, and destroyed homes. And there are health effects as well from, from extreme weather. So for example, last year, in 2019, sorry, there were 653 hospitalizations from heat stroke and the majority of those in people who are over, over 65. So the climate hazards that Fukuoka faces are, are significant and they are common within Japan and indeed across other subtropical cities. So again, what makes Fukuoka useful and interesting to learn from is that the, the climate hazards are perhaps common across the, um, across the region. So when, when, when people think about green space and adapting to climate change in Fukuoka, Many people will be familiar with the, um, the iconic uh, across uh, terraced building, the Green Terrace, which is a, a very famous um, structure that you see a, a lot in, in, in policy exchange and in research when people talk about green space in Fukuoka. Nonetheless, broadly speaking, there are two, two actions that, that Fukuoka City is undertaking to, to use green space to adapt to the effects of climate change I just talked about. And, one is for mitigating these urban heat island effects, for cooling down the city using green walls and roofs, connecting and enhancing green spaces. And a second way is by using green space to retain rainwater, channel into drainage systems and reduce some of these, these flood risks. And so urban greening is a core component of um, adapting to climate change in, in Fukuoka City. And indeed, I just wanted to show you these. These are a couple of images, some extracts from Fukuoka City's most recent uh, Green Basic Plan, which, um, and I apologise, the, the, the graphics are quite small, but the key point to take away is that in these plans, at least, Fukuoka City has, has done, I think, as a researcher, I would say quite well to think about how different green spaces might be connected up to provide benefits across the whole city, not just thinking in isolation, but thinking about how different green spaces can be linked up to provide heat risk reduction and rainfall risk reduction across the whole city. So that's a real strength as a researcher, I would say, of Fukuoka's plans. Similarly, the most recent um, plan, which has been developed for the um, Ohori Ko in the Ohori Park area um, at, a, at a, a smaller scale, looks likewise at how to enhance and extend green spaces for, for multiple benefits. And there's a very clear and very strong vision there of how, um, again, how green space might 
lead not just to a healthier city, but also one that is more resilient to the impacts of climate change. So these, these, big, these big scale actions, plans, ideas are all great, but what about things that are happening at a, at a smaller scale as, um, as was discussed in the introduction to the session, working kind of at the community and neighborhood level is also very important. And, and Fukuoka City has been um, undertaking a, a range of initiatives to encourage um, members of the public to develop green walls, green curtains in their own homes. And they have, this was a few years ago now, but they had a, a competition with small cash prizes for the people that could grow the best green curtains. And extending these, these initiatives to the household level is very important in maximizing the benefits across a city that we get from, from green spaces. And I just wanted to show you a little bit on the right, um, some, some findings from a survey that uh, my, my collaborator, Professor Kayo Kondo from Kyushu University and her, her lab, her research group undertook last year, which was found that um, residents in Fukuoka generally are very, um, very supportive of different greening measures and can use lots of, of different strategies and techniques to, uh, to, to understand the value of increasing vegetation and, and members of the public are, are willing to do this. So um, this is underpinned by a, a strong scientific evidence base. There's a lot of research that has been undertaken locally in Fukuoka over a number of decades to uh, understand especially the thermal environment uh, and how planting trees, enhancing and maximizing green space can reduce risk from, from, from heat. And so there's a, there's a strong evidence base locally of how um, science and local research institutes have produced knowledge that can inform, in theory at least, planning practice for adapting to climate change in, in, in Fukuoka City. So the, the, this, this research has been going on for, for several decades, and there's, there's this long history of knowledge within the city of how green spaces can, in theory at least, provide um, climate risk reduction benefits. Nonetheless, as I said at the start, um, what is happening in, in Fukuoka is not perfect, and there are a number of challenges. And one of them in particular is how to reconcile the fact that you have the, the, these potential benefits from, from, from green spaces, how to reconcile that with the fact that this is a still rapidly growing, expanding, densifying, renewing city. So I've shown there on the left, the, there's an image from what's called the Tenjin Big Bang Initiative. And this is a, a, a vision, a plan to renew um, the, the core area essentially of Fukuoka. And you know, one can question there how, how well these very comprehensive and very thorough and we very well thought through green space plans actually balance up with this, 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 um, this drive for, for renewal and how do we get buy-in beyond one or two flagship green space projects. And so Fukuoka was, was featured recently in, in, in Inverse magazine, the, the URLs at the top there, as an example of a, a climate resilient city through its, its greening efforts. And just to kind of show you a little bit, I, I don't expect you to hear some, some homework for those of you that are keen. Um, here's some of the, the, the peer reviewed research which we've produced over the, the last couple of years that underpins what I'm talking about. I can see that I am at, uh, at time. So I'm just going to sum up very quickly by leaving you with three points. One being that Fukuoka illustrates how green spaces can be drawn into climate change adaptation planning, especially for mitigating urban heat island effects. The city also illustrates the potential to work with local universities and research organizations for an evidence-driven approach to green space planning. However, there are challenges in turning that policy rhetoric and these plans into practice and how do you go beyond one or two flagship and exemplar sites to um, roll out greening more broadly across the city? So with that, I will simply stop. And I would like to say chiki on dankan, no te kio o sui shan, to ikan bai. My details are here. 
And I look forward to hearing Nakamura-san's response from Fukuoka City. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Leslie Mabon. Uh, very quick overview of the challenges as well as some of the good practices that Fukuoka City has done. And I think uh, all of us would want to hear what are some of the reactions of our uh, director from Fukuoka City. Okay. Our next speaker joined the City of Yokohama administration in 1999. He has been involved in the management and maintenance of urban parks and was appointed to his current position in 2019. He is currently involved in the promotion of greenery, planning, and coordination of projects related to parks and green uh, spaces, as well as surveys of related sites and guidance on development activities in the city. Friends, let's all welcome the director of the Greenery City Planning Section Flower and Greenery City Department, Housing and Urban Planning Bureau, Mr. Junya Nakamura. Nakamura-san, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, introduction. So I am a Nakamura. So uh, talking about the uh, policy challenges, uh, well, uh, the uh, budget for implementation of project and also in order to uh, maintain the uh, favorable green, uh, we need to get the support from the uh, government, also local people. To that end, uh, we have a shortage of the uh, local citizen. Uh, we, uh, we have a difficulty in getting support from the local people. And in order to respond to this, uh, so the local citizen needs to have a better understanding on the value of the green. And therefore, the Fukuoka city needs to convey the uh, various effects of the green, such as the space for uh, living thing and the landscaping and the green will prevent the uh, disaster. To that end, we uh, lend equipment and tool to maintain the zoo green. So we are con providing the enabling environment for citizens to participate. え、次に <laughs> 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 Uh, next, I would like to talk about uh, the uh, about the question I received. That is something that has impressed me uh, about the Fukuoka City's approach to green space planning. So what we are doing as a city to integrate uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, excuse me for a moment and resilience more fully into our green uh, space plan from uh, now on, and how we will address climate risks such as heat and flooding in future city green space plans. So Fukuoka City's basic plan for uh, greenery was formulated in 2009 and will be revised in light of the recent environmental problems we are facing. In revising the plan, we will continue with the measures that have been highly evaluated so far, such as uh, protecting the green framework of Fukuoka City. and. At the same time, taking into account new perspectives, such as the idea of green infrastructure that utilize the diverse functions of the natural environment and SDGs that aim to become a sustainable city, we will revise and plan for the next generation. With regard to our cooperation with the university and research institutes, what are the benefits 
and how we have incorporated scientific knowledge and evidence uh, into our climate adaptation measures as well as green uh, plan and what we learned. So uh, about this, I would like to say that in order to proceed with the project, it is essential to gain the understanding of the citizens. To do that, scientific knowledge and evidence from universities and research institutes are very important. The city has in the formulation of the basic green plan and the basic plan for the conversation, conservation of private green spaces collaborated with third party committees of experts and will continue to do so into the future. So with regard to the network with other cities, uh, how we sort of cooperate with other cities, um, because I think this is very important. Uh, from the viewpoint of developing advanced measures, we collaborate with the national government, uh, Tokyo or Kita Kyushu City and Kumamoto City, which are large cities near Fukuoka City, and share information on advanced cases and issues that each municipality is implementing so that we can effectively implement our projects. In addition, we collaborate with with neighboring municipalities, which share the same catchment basin to protect the rich natural environment of the basin through forestation and forest conservation in the water source area. Uh, finally, at, in Fukuoka uh, City, against the climate uh, risk what kind of actions that we are sort of taking. So in terms of the city's greenery administration, from the perspective of disaster prevention when developing the parks, to prevent rainwater from running off rapidly, um, permeable paving is used and open spaces of two square meters per person are provided to serve as evacuation areas in the event of a disaster. In addition to prevent the spread of fire, fire resistant trees are being used along the street Fukuoka City is blessed with a rich natural environment surrounded by mountains and the sea, and has protected and nurtured this environment by controlling development in the mountains above 80 meters in elevation and preserving the natural coast and uh, tidal flats in the sea. In the future, we will continue to protect this rich natural environment and make the most of our compact urban environment to create a low-carbon recycling-oriented city with a low environmental impact to be an environmentally friendly, safe, secure, beautiful, and comfortable city with a high quality of life for all the citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very engaging, and uh, it's good to hear uh, some of your quick and candid comments uh, on how Fukuoka is dealing with it. Uh, Director Nakamura-san. And I think it's crucial also to understand more uh, after what uh, Dr. Babud also mentioned, because most of the cities in East Asia and the Pacific uh, are saying that they're not as developed as Japan, right? So what are some of the challenges that they are experiencing as they start looking at uh, doing green spaces uh, in urban areas? And uh, the, the, the discussion right now is how do they start? Right? And how do they plug this in terms of their prioritization in various uh, cities? Because the competing uh, priorities are there, dealing with the COVID pandemic, dealing with shocks, and where will they get the budget also? How do they engage uh, other stakeholders, private sector, to be able to participate and contribute in this initiative? So this morning, we have heard practical uh, insights, stories, experiences, as well as the challenges that Fukuoka is experiencing. But I would like to ask uh, our participants if you have questions. Uh, we can now proceed with the question and answer. Uh, Dr. Mabon, as well as uh, Director Nakamura-san, is, is, is here to respond to these questions. Well, we are waiting uh, for our participants uh, to ask the question. Uh, let me ask a practical question from most of our uh, 
different cities in East Asia and the Pacific, their main question is, how do you finance this? Is there an opportunity uh, to leverage on funds out there, grants, so that they can start uh, maybe planning as well as piloting some of these uh, green urban uh, space projects? I can say something to that very briefly. So uh, I'll explain what's happening in um, where I'm from. So I'm from, from Scotland and Glasgow is our, our largest city and Glasgow is facing this issue as well of how you finance a lot of these green initiatives. And one of the, the strategies that, that Glasgow's city government is using is to understand the costs of not taking action. So if you don't develop and maintain green spaces and, and nature-based approaches, Glasgow City Council has calculated there's a very significant financial risk to doing that. And so what one, one approach potentially is to, to look at, well, how much money in the longer term can these greening type approaches save, particularly when we consider their cost in relation to hard engineering solutions, which potentially can be more expensive in the long term. To do that, however, needs a lot of skill in understanding the technical benefits and also in calculating that financing and you know, developing those skills within city governments is really important, I think, for the, the Asia Pacific region. Thank you, uh, Dr. Maben. For Director Nakamura Stein, in terms of highlighting the getting the city to city uh, cooperation and networking, you have talked about getting the, the support of Tokyo City. How difficult was it to start this process? Because uh, for most of our developing uh, cities in East Asia, their challenge is their neighboring cities also are experiencing the same problem. So how, how did you start uh, the city to city network? And was there instant support? Thank you very much for the question. So the city to city network is very important. So the government sometimes hosts a conference where uh, we can also participate and we share our own challenges and issues and we also learn from other cities in terms of their advanced initiatives. I think on a daily basis we try to find opportunity to communicate with others. I think that's quite important. Thank you very much, uh, Director Nakamura-san. I think uh, this morning we are privileged to hear very candid uh, insights and experiences from Fukuoka City. And uh, Dr. Weber has also highlighted uh, quickly in a few slides uh, this interesting experience that Fukuoka went through. What we want, uh, and usually uh, in doing these technical deep dives and working closely with uh, TDLC and uh, some cities in Japan, is that the experiences are very candid. And for developing countries, it's not difficult to relate, right? Uh, they tell us the stories of how they started, uh, the very practical do's and don'ts, and how to start uh, doing some of these uh, initiatives. And for this morning, it was truly a pleasure to be part of this conversation. So thank you very much to all our speakers and uh, to all the participants. We hope that it was useful and practical. If you have further questions, you can uh, send an email to our organizers so that they can share it with uh, Director Nakamura-san and uh, Dr. Maven. So thank you very much and back to you, Victor. Thank you very much, Leslie, and thank you to our speakers. Now we see focus and we go to the case of Sydney in Australia. This session will explain the key social development goals index approach and it will do it by using the example of how it was applied in West Sydney development. With that, we will set light into how it can be applied to other cities. The moderator of this session is Stamatis Kotusas. He's a senior land administration specialist at the PAN, and he's based in Seoul. I would like now to invite Stamatis to join the floor. Stamatis, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victor. I hope everyone can hear me and see me well. 
Um, before introducing our distinguished speaker, I would like to congratulate the Tokyo Development Learning Center for organizing this very timely session on climate smart urban forums. Um, in 30 years from now, by 2050, it is estimated that the urban area uh, coverage expansion in the East Asian Pacific region will increase by 80%. For land professionals who work with developing and emerging countries in this region, the extent of this urban expansion, whether through formal and planned processes or through informal and unregulated ones, presents both enormous challenges but also opportunities. Financing and implementing um, innovative climate smart development cannot come from national and city level governments alone. The private sector has a key role to play in achieving climate smart urban development. And this important role is recognized by the SDG ad agenda, which calls upon all business to apply their creativity and innovation uh, to solving sustainable development challenges. We are about to become wiser about how this works in practice. So I'm honored to present Mr. Yasushi Fukuizumi, Senior Executive Fellow and Vice President for Power Systems at Mitsubishi um, Heavy Industries. Fukuizumi Shan um, graduated from the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Tokyo in 1982 and has spent his professional career with Mitsubishi um, Heavy Industries in Japan as well as overseas. Uh, we look forward um, to this presentation on the key SDGs index approach in the, cost, in the context of West Sydney um, with a distinct focus on energy transition. Um, Fukuizumi Shan, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stamatis-san. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, my name is Yasushi Fukuizumi. I'm working for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. So let me just explain about that uh, our company first. Could you put up that my slides on the screen, please? Yes. So next page, please. This is the content that I'm talking today uh, first introduction of company. And then the second is that uh, our approach of proper target setting by visualization method. Third is the basic infrastructure idea for sharing economy. Okay, next page, please. So MHI Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is known probably to the people in Japan, but the uh, for the foreign people, uh, let, let me just explain about our company. We have uh, 80,000 employees worldwide. Uh, our, our annual revenue is about 40 billion. And then the, we have uh, 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 subsidiary companies, including NMHI, the 260 companies worldwide. And uh, we have uh, uh, 25,000 patents you know, globally, which that uh, uh, half of them are actually at the outside Japan. Okay, next page, please. So sometimes we are called as a department store of the machinery. You know, we are making a lot of machineries. And then the, I just pick up the, some of the uh, 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 equipments and machineries that we are contributing. We believe we are contributing to that, uh, you know, SDG goals. And then the, for the climate action 13, we have our, uh, the geothermal plant and uh, you know, wind turbine and also carbon capture system. All those uh, you know, technologies we have and then we are proceeding the actual business with those equipment. Okay, next page, please. So I'm um, just talking about the Sydney. So, uh, <clears throat> We actually participated uh, uh, three years ago as a foundation partner to that, uh, you know, their new city development, West Sydney site called Aerotropolis. Uh, why it's called? It's actually the city newly built in the greenfield, having the international airport, 24 hours international airport. Uh, initially dedicated for the cargo, you know, purpose, cargo purpose. And then because of the uh, Australians, you know, uh, current situation, which that uh, most of the shore area is developed pretty much, but the, for the uh, growing 
you know, uh, population and then also the smooth economic growth, they have to uh, explore the development inland side, inland side. And uh, for that purpose, this West Sydney project is uh, gonna be the very, very symbolic project. And uh, the picture is that uh, our, you know, MOU with them, and uh, we started activity with them. Next page, please. So when we started to study as a you know, foundation partner, we actually uh, uh, explained to them that uh, you have to have that uh, three viewpoints, vision, three major viewpoints as a vision. And then the, we have, you have to uh, probably work on those you know, uh, course of actions related with the three viewpoints. First one is the top one is a, uh, the city is continuously growing and uh, you have to ensure that the continuous smooth growth of the city, especially for the, uh, the West of Sydney, like a green field city, you have to have that uh, milestones and then the uh, smooth you know, growth of the city. And uh, of course, employment opportunities needs to be secured. And then for the city to you know, invite, to attract the people, living, living comfort, convenience, and the residence is a very important factor as well. And then for that purpose, you have to have that strategy to brand your city uh, by some method which that uh, we are proposing this, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the visualization, you know, uh, methodology called Kuan. So with these three major viewpoints and then the necessary actions, city needs to firstly set the target in five years or 10 years. And then of course, benchmarking the current situation of the Sydney city and then starting from there, how would you like to develop the city? By visualizing the, all those parameters which we can correct from the social activity. Next page, please. So the, the, as I said, that the, they have to set that the target, grow, uh, uh, target as a grow, you know, growth goal. And then the, for us to, visualize that the situation, we, you, you have to use that the public available data. You, you cannot use your own you know, uh, picked up data. You have to choose that the public data to be more transparent. So for that matter, we actually collaborate with the local university, you know, the University of New South Wales for this methodology. And then the, why don't we try that one to firstly pick up the city of Sydney and then set the uh, 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 ambitious target on five years and 10 years. That was what we have proposed to them. Next page, please. And uh, every city uh, from now on needs to utilize the renewable energy as much as possible. That is no exception. But uh, we are saying that the, for you to do that, you have to have that the proper infrastructure placed in place, you know, uh, placed in the first, first phase, even before development. So for that matter, we actually uh, propose that step-by-step -step approach, step one to three. First one is to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, fix that uh, you know, methodology by using the current uh, you know, available ind indices. And then the uh, think of the effective and then the dependable infrastructure, infrastructure which can also utilize the renewable energy, you know, inside or outside, very very effectively. So that is the uh, second step: energy management and the multi utility uh, concept, which I'm talking about in detail later. And then finally try to maximize the renewable energy so that to your uh, uh, CO2 emission per GDP in the city is, it becomes very, very low. And then finally, we are you know, targeting to achieve that the carbon neutral, let's say year of 2050, we have, to, we have to finally achieve that one goal. 
So as 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 such that we said in a step by step approach, uh, why why don't we do this? Okay, next page, please. So uh, what we what we're gonna do is that actually we pick up the public data uh, uh, suitable for the future vision or target, first of all. And then we pick up the public data and then visualize and uh, a current and the future. And uh, uh, with that, the uh, uh, purpose of the guideline, we we'll propose the, the guideline. And then also we propose the energy infra, proper energy infrastructure, infrastructure to be placed in the first, first phase. Next page, please. So this is the actually the uh, preliminary results of the, the current, you know, the uh, uh, Sydney area, and then also uh, uh, the target, you know, uh, of the future West Sydney uh, city. So uh, current data we use that uh, you know uh, data from the Australian domestic sources. And then the uh, uh, by consulting with that uh, organization, you know, of the development, we set the target with the higher renewable scenario in 2030. And then the uh, uh, we set the target, and then the, we actually work on that. Uh, the, uh, what is needed to uh, uh, incorporate such you know, development? That's what we are currently doing. I think by using the public available data, every city can visualize this kind of uh, 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 results. And then by, for the purpose of simplifying that the visualization, we actually categorize all the parameters in three categories, which is economy and society and environment. And then the, we show that the, how you are balancing out right now, and then the, if you want to put that the economic in, you know, uh, in the priority in the first five years, set the target you know, uh, relatively higher in the economic first five, five years, and then move to that, uh, your priority on the environment in the next five years. As such, we are proposing to the uh, organization. Next page, please. So, uh, we, like I mentioned, we set up the three uh, categories, and these are the uh, some of the representative, you know, the the uh, uh, data, which actually in total that uh, we uh, collected uh, about forty, you know, parameters, you know, in, in included in this, you know, three categories, and then the uh, make that uh, some, you know, mathematical uh, uh, average, you know, calculation we. Uh, create that uh, you know the uh, visualization you know in index, and then the if the city wants to go for that uh, you know uh, different you know the the purpose or the target, then that uh, we just actually that uh, uh, show that on the right hand side the case one two three four, so every city has its own you know per policy. and uh, depending on that uh, you know the people residential you know people's opinion. So the, some people wants to have that renewable passive first place, and the, some people are relying on the, the thermal first, and then move on to the renewable. So as such that, uh, uh, depending on the policy, we can make that uh, variety of you know, parameter setting. That's what I'm explaining in this chart. Next page, please. So with that, the actually that uh, uh, we, uh, did that the first phase of that the study with the uh, University of New South Wales and the proposed the uh, development company already. And uh, uh, by that time that we started to note, note that uh, probably we're gonna need to include that another area of the resilience factor as well. Okay, Th that is our next challenge. Next please, next page please. So, uh, this is probably, uh, as you are aware, that the Asian energy situation, that the Asia is the emerging you know, area where that uh, you are using the energy more for the smooth economic growth. 
And then currently, probably the coal might be the one you know you are depending on, and the coal needs to be reduced for the global warming you know uh, effect. And then uh, you have to rely on the gas for that uh, uh, some period of time, and then expand renewable. So uh, with that the macro trends, you have to also think of your own city development depending on this energy portfolio. And then for that purpose, I think you know this kind of index approach is quite effective uh, for you. So from next page, I will talk about uh, some of the example that we are proposing to West Sydney. Next page, please. So basically, the important you know the infrastructure to be placed in a fast phase is the, the something which you can share the energy each other, and then something you can backing up each other for the residency purpose. For that purpose, we uh, actually you know, propose to that uh, uh, West Indian Development uh, Corporation, why don't we use this multi-utility concept? This is gonna be uh, underground uh, uh, structure, which will have that, uh, 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 power and then also the uh, heat energy and uh, communication and everything in a common tunnel. That makes that uh, the all the uh, patent uh, uh, the uh, the patent uh, uh, the the clients in the city to share the energy effectively and then also backing up each other effectively. That is the basic idea which we are proposing now. And then the, this is not applicable, or not only applicable to the new development, but, but also in the city of Tokyo, uh, not largely, but uh, the, some of the uh, subdivision of the office area, which we are, we are locating in the downtown Tokyo, uh, they have that, uh, this type of common you know, multi-utility concept as well. And then they, they are keep on you know, uh, making the underground tunnel to have this kind of concept actually. So meaning that uh, I'm saying that uh, this, even for the developed city, you can also apply this kind of concept. Next page, please. And then the, if you can successfully do that as a one cluster area, which that uh, probably the uh, some landmark type of building is uh, located. For example, in the left hand side, the airport is a very very big, you know, uh, landmark, you know, uh, building. So around there, you know, firstly first cluster will be probably uh, made, and then because they have that uh, other city development area called this industrial park or university campus area or commercial facility. Why, why don't we do that cluster on the, each area by using the uh, landmark building, such as res, let's say if it's an industrial park, it's a, a definitely a factory. And then the university area, it might be a data center, which is also using a lot of energy. Commercial facility, of course, at the large, you know, shopping mall would be the one. And then the, around there that the, you can create some cluster, you know, uh, city. And then finally, connecting each other and then the making sure that uh, uh, some of the surplus energy can be shared with other cluster or if it's emergency situation, backing up each other. That is a kind of concept we are proposing. Okay, next page, please. For the long term, you know, development, uh, you know, milestone, we propose that uh, why don't we just work on that uh, city cluster launch first, and then connecting that cluster, you know, each other, and then finally, uh, a lot of you know transportation and the other piece of the uh, uh, the city important infrastructure incorporation would be finally achieved to to finally achieve that the carbon neutral society in that, that 2050 with, with kind of this kind of three major uh, uh, milestones. Uh, also, uh, bottom side, side is that the re in renewable energy you know, ratio. Uh, with that, uh, we are proposing that the long term you know, strategy, the uh, city development strategy right now. Next page, please. 
And uh, for the other key, you know, infrastructure, uh, uh, you can have that airport or a harbor port is going to be the one also. And then the station, railway station, is uh, also the one key uh, infrastructure that you can think of uh, as a landmark. And then around there, you can, you know, uh, create such kind of, uh, you know, network. Next page, please. And then the, also, you can think of the satellite city concept. Perhaps that uh, uh, city of Fukuoka, like a big major city, the uh, center of the city is there, but the some, you know, most of the residents, residential people is actually commuting from that uh, remote area, which we can call in Japanese way, Satoyama. That is a kind of uh, iron city where that uh, your uh, residential area is the most, you know, the major uh, 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 portion for that. And then also you have to secure that, uh, you know, food security for that matter that uh, uh, agricultural business can be uh, somehow uh, sustainably maintained with the people working there. For that, you know, the infrastructure, people's infrastructure, Satoyama is very important and the effective, you know, for the, those agricultural, you know, uh, businesses as well. As such that uh, we are now proposing. Next page. So the uh, energy is the, uh, it used to be, it used to be uh, 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 like, a, you know, major, you know, the country, uh, like uh, uh, OPEC company, uh, the, the developed company like Japan and the US and the Europe, the, we have that the classic way of building the infrastructure by building that the large centers, you know, energy center remotely and then sending one way energy to the city. And that is a kind of conventional approach. So from now on, it's, it's gonna be more and more distributed as that uh, uh, renewable energy is more distributed everywhere. So uh, with that uh, very large, you know, uh, 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 concept that uh, you have to think of your city development as well. And then the outback utilization is that uh, not only agriculture, but also the source of the, uh, the renewable energy, it's going to be important. Okay, next page, please. This is my final key uh, message. So the conventional way to build the economy and the new city used to put the priority on the economic rational and the centralized approach as it was most efficient. And uh, most of the developed countries have done this way, which is no longer the re reference to the sustainable development of new city. Uh, renewable energy is domestic resource, which is not influenced by the global market volatility. That is good for the local uh, economy. But the renewable energy is intermittent and uncontrollable energy resource, which requires proper management. So new city development needs to consider such basic management function, as well as the conventional energy efficiency. So besides that, residency aspect needs to be in place as well. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Fukuizumi-san. Um, this is a, an impressive and, and practical way of integrating the SDG agenda, um, not only in the definition of the vision of West Sydney, but also in your core business as um, MHI, as a company. Um, thank you for um, this presentation. I, th I see that um we we have a question already from uh the participants asking how scalable is the um, key index approach or qoen is it uh, a costly approach um for a city to adopt basically it's very i would say very cheap <laughs> because we collaborate the local university of course that uh, we pay some you know the fees to that local university but uh, in fact, uh, we actually do it a kind of a voluntary act activity. Of course, mm -hmm. that, uh, towards the end of this activity, we have a business uh, you know, intention to be an energy player locally there. But 
for the as a consultation purpose initially, uh, we said, you know, is a consultation which is a very you know cheap you know activity, and uh, we all also collaborated the local university, not the expensive you know consultant consultancy firm. So yeah. yeah. Um, from from my end, um, another question: As uh, the World Bank is embarking on a on a new programmatic initiative in the East Asia Pacific region, um, if you had a delegation of city officials and the mayor in front of you, and the question is, how can they promote partnerships with the private sector? Um, mm -hmm. uh, how did you end up um, working with West Sydney? How did you develop the memorandum of understanding? What are some of the key advice right. you would give to the mayor? Right. Yeah, that is actually a good question. And then the, that is a kind of a challenge. So the city will have the many, many uh, stakeholders. You know, uh, it, 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 it wouldn't be that just a business, you know, player, you know, office, you know, player or real estate or maybe some you know, uh, uh, telecommunication company, many, many business players. So we have to get that, uh, all their understanding. You know, why don't we do this? <laughs> this is gonna be good for you, finally. So that is the, such a you know, uh, 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 understanding side is uh, uh, quite a challenge. And then the, we, we are actually lucky to do that in that, uh, uh, in that the West Sydney development because that, uh, we participated as a foundation partner and, and then the West Sydney development company is quite you know, cooperative to that, our concept. And then the, actually they actually uh, called all those possible uh, partners and the business players in one place. And then the, we can actually have the talk with them. And then the uh, important thing is also that the, how to monetize this, you know, the, you know, uh, city development, you know, branding is very important, but how to recover that uh, your investment for this, you know, additional infrastructure such as, you know, uh, underground the tunnel and so on. That is the finally, ultimately, is the actually revenue side from the real estate probably majority would be. So the uh, getting the understanding, full understanding from the uh, lead, you know, uh, uh, such a real estate company is very, very important. Very, very important. But I guess if it's success, if, if it becomes successful, probably they can invite at the, all the, such a, you know, the company who are conscious about that the sustainability, such as GAFA, and then also they are rich enough. So you can probably have that a uh, little bit higher rate of that, that ten, you know, uh, tenant lease agreement and so on. That is what uh, we are proposing to the real estate company. Too. Excellent. Thank yeah. you very much, uh, Fukuizumi-san. What you described is a visionary and participatory way of getting there. Um, and let's not forget, you talked about the SDGs, that the final and very important SDG is right. SDG 17 on building partnerships for the goals. and the private sector is key. Thank you very much. The, the floor back to Victor. Thank you very much, Estamatis and Fukuizumi-san. I think it was uh, very interesting to, to know more about the uh, key index approach and this focus in uh, SDGs. Um, and now uh, I would like to uh, move on to, to the final part of this session. Uh, I would like to invite Jun Hee Kim. She's the sector leader uh, at the World Bank for Sustainable Development for China Mongolia and Korea, and she will be joining us from Beijing. She will be sharing some of her reflections about the discussions we have had today, uh, and we'll wrap up uh, this event. So let me please invite uh, Jun Hee to the stage. Jun Hee, if you are ready, uh, please uh, come to the stage. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this wonderful event. And thank you so much for all the presenters and the facilitator. Uh, it has been really absolutely a pleasure to, to listen to the discussion what's happening uh, in Fukuoka, all this wonderful initiative that you have been doing, and also from private sector, some of the important engagement that um, uh, the company has been doing. So uh, I had uh, just a few uh, reflections that I wanted to share listening to the presentation. 
Um, first, um, I think Bo's presentation highlighted the, the importance of having a scientific evidence and analytical tool for us to plan and prepare uh, and then invest in climate resilient and uh, uh, climate smart cities. And I was thinking, you know, if I had to go to the mayor and then I had to make a case why green space is important, uh, I need some numbers, I need some evidence how this is contributing to climate adaptation, better resilience, and why this makes sense, no? So I think from that sense, having this presentation and, and being able to show with the data and evidence why we need to invest in, I think that is a very important uh, lesson that I, I took away uh, from you. Um, in particular, I think uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fukuzumi mentioned about this index uh, that you develop with the local university, which didn't cost that much, uh, but I think it's a great uh, benchmark and compare you know, what the city is now and where the city can go 20 years, 30 years, and being able to track the and, and monitor the progress. I think that's a very powerful tool that we can maybe think about, you know, working with our client uh, in any stage of the Pacific region and, and elsewhere. So that's uh, the first uh, reflection on the importance of analysis and uh, to the scientific evidence uh, that, that um, you know, in our work. Um, second uh, point was um, on the importance of working outside of city government uh, with the wider stakeholders. And, and here we are talking about Academia Research Institute. Um, I think earlier, uh, Mr. Nakamura mentioned about his efforts to engage with the neighboring country, uh, neighboring cities. Uh, metropolitan regions, uh, different departments. So I think city engagement, especially on this climate resilience agenda, require multiple stakeholders. Uh, and I think, I think the role of academia is very important, but also for city governments to coordinate uh, you know, the planning, the investment um, in, in this important area will be growingly important. So, in our region, we have done a lot of work on metropolitan management and coordination uh, of studies. And I think here, when we talk about climate agenda, um, I think it's also equally important uh, a topic for us to think. Um, so the third part, um, Bo's presentation raised about financing and how do we scale up? And, and I think, uh, you know, the uh, professor uh, Mabon mentioned about the, you know, estimating the cost of inaction. I think that's very important. So when we talk about, for instance, green uh, uh, space and the solution, um, I think we should think about not only in terms of its impact, uh, its benefit on urban resilience uh, and, and the flood risk reduction, but I think more broadly, uh, is the potential impact that it could have for cities' livability um, and the competitiveness. No? So the, the more you have a green space and, and a, a public parks, whatever, I think it makes the cities more livable. Um, and then it has a huge and beneficial impact on your real estate value. So that could then lead to increased uh, uh, potential revenue for property tax. Um, and then we also know a lot of uh, uh, cities that attract a lot of uh, workers and talents tend to be also the cities that are really livable uh, uh, with a lot of uh, urban amenities and et cetera. So I think when we talk about this uh, investment for climate resilient cities, I think we need to think about not only from the climate angle, but also for the broader cities livability and the competitiveness. I think, I think that's another lesson that I'm taking away. I think um, the, the Mitsubishi case also, I think he mentioned about the potential financing tool and the real estate uh, uh, impact. I think you know, there's a very important uh, linkage that we could uh, uh, think more. So these are the three main points um, that, that I had. Um, I think, 
you know, we, we learned American lessons from today's presentation. I think there is still a lot that could be discussed more. I'm curious to see, for instance, um, you know, the case of Mitsubishi's airport in Western Sydney, uh, you know, from private sector point of view, what are the critical policies or incentives uh, or regulatory uh, carers for private sector to be more interested in uh, investing uh, in, in technology and innovation for climate uh, resilient cities from private sector point of view so that we can also uh, uh, advise and inform uh, city governments uh, who tend to be our client, you know. So, so it has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for the opportunity to reflect some of the uh, thoughts that are that are coming out of this presentation. And I look forward to having more conversation uh, moving forward. And and um, thank you. Uh, over to you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Junki, and thank you very much for uh, uh, adding your reflections to this event and uh, distilling the, the key insights and lessons learned from all our audience. And with this, we are concluding this event. But remember, this is just the fourth event in our knowledge sharing series of low carbon and climate smart cities. Please stay tuned for our future events as we continue to explore the path toward low carbon cities from a variety of angles. The next event of this series will focus on cap and trade program for low carbon cities. We'll have Japanese and international experts introducing the approaches and key elements of this program that could support our cities in becoming climate smart. This next event will take place on November the 12th, and we will share more details with you through uh, our email list, but also social uh, media and posts on the DLC webpage. So please stay tuned and visit our webpage if you want more information. Now, let me finish with a big thank you to all our speakers and to you, our participants, for joining us today in this conversation. We would like to extend a special thank you to the organizers of the Asia Pacific City Summit, Fukuoka City, and the participants who are joining us from this event. And now we pass the connection back to the Asia Pacific City Summit for those attending this event. Have a great day and goodbye.